How H.H. H. Holmes lured people to his hotel of death. Imagine you're arriving at the World's Fair. It's 1893. You've heard of the wondrous things that are happening there, of technology the likes of which the world has never seen, and of a gigantic rotating wheel, tall like a building, from which you can see all of Chicago. You took a long train ride to get there. You had no idea if you'd find a place to stay, but figured with the size of the fair and the excitement around it, there was bound to be somewhere you could find a bed. You find a small building near Jackson Park, where the fair is being held. It has some flats and a convenient drugstore on the ground floor. Doesn't look fancy, but seems fit for the time you'll spend there. The landlord's name is Holmes. You will never get out of there. It might seem like a horror film scenario, and even though it is true that there's a lot of legends and exaggeration around H. H. Holmes' so-called murder castle, some of the legends surrounding America's first serial killer are true. Welcome to Bad Things. Today we'll talk about H. H. Holmes, how he built his infamous hotel, and how he used it taking advantage of the World's Fair happening in Chicago. The details around Holmes' life are conflicting, and we will try to take a measured approach instead of just going with the wildest theories, some of which became quite ingrained in the American imagination. But first of all, who was Holmes? His birth name was Herman Webster Mudgett. He was born in a deeply conservative Methodist family in New Hampshire. Throughout his youth, Despite proving his intelligence and business acumen, he also showed some troubling behaviors. It was claimed that while studying medicine, he would take bodies from the morgue, burn them, and use them to commit insurance fraud. His first wife, Clara, accused him of treating her violently and ended up leaving him before he graduated from medical school. For years after graduating, he was involved in several insurance frauds and a couple of other murky occurrences like the sudden death of a boy after ingesting a medicine he prepared, or the disappearance of another boy followed by him quickly leaving town. Holmes was also a bigamist, since he never formally divorced Clara, the wife that left him, nor Myrta, another woman he would marry and leave soon after, filing for but never finalizing a divorce. Later, he would fake marriage papers with several other women. He arrived in Chicago in 1886, and started going by H. H. Holmes. He found work in a drug store and eventually bought the store from the owners, Elizabeth Holston and Dr. Holston. Although there's several accounts of the Holstons disappearing after Holmes's purchase of the store, more recent investigations have established that they got away from Holmes, surviving well into the 20th century. Through several schemes and frauds, Holmes bought a bigger lot and built a two-story building to house the new drugstore and possibly some apartments. When, some years later, the site of the Word Columbian exhibition was chosen, it turned out that Holmes's property was relatively close to it. And so he hatched a plan to establish his building as a hotel for the World's Fair. There's a lot of conflicting information about Holmes's famous murder castle, and the design modifications he did in it, so take the following with a grain of salt. What is confirmed is that he added a third floor and claimed it was meant to house people coming to the World's Fair. In the original building, Holmes had added a chute that went to the basement, which legend has it was used to transport the bodies of some of his victims. Of course, it could also have been only for dirty laundry. He also added a secret room that was in none of the building plans, which could have hidden bodies, or it could have housed just some unused furniture. And finally, the basement. The basement of Holmes's building is the room with most legends attached to it. Contemporary accounts spoke of a cremation chamber, gas jets, and in general a sort of torture and murder basement. Holmes had used cremation chambers before in his schemes with cadavers, but apparently none of these modifications of the basement were ever confirmed. What is highly likely is that Holmes's first victims were killed in that basement. Holmes had been having an affair at the time with a woman named Julia, who had been married to Ned Connor. The couple lived in Holmes's building, and Ned worked for him until he found out about the affair. Julia and her daughter Pearl stayed in the hotel after Ned left, 
and disappeared on Christmas Eve of 1891. Holmes apparently was going to perform an abortion on Julia, and according to his later account, he botched the procedure, killing her in the process. After that, Holmes claimed he poisoned Pearl because she knew too much. The partial skeleton of a child around Pearl's age was found after excavating Holmes's basement during the investigation. Holmes's next victim was Emmeline Sigrand. Just like with Julia, he seduced her and started manipulating her. She worked at his drugstore and later disappeared in December 1892. Around this time, Holmes met Benjamin Patezel, and he would use him in several of his further crimes. There were two more victims whose bodies were never found, and it is likely Holmes killed them in Chicago. They were a former actress, Minnie Williams, and her sister, Annie. The last communication anyone had with the Williams sisters was a letter received by their aunt from Annie, which claimed they were going to Europe with Brother Harry. Holmes never went to Europe. The fair finally began in 1893, a year later than expected. By then, Holmes had already killed at least three people, and by the end of the year, he would kill the Williams sisters. Holmes claimed he killed as many as 27 people during his time in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto, many of them during the World's Fair. It is claimed he lured mainly young women to his hotel, and that some of them would disappear, and that within the chaos reigning because of the fair, he was never caught. His confession, however, should be put into question since he was paid by the Hearst newspapers in exchange for it, and some of the people he claimed to have killed were actually alive at the time. He would, however, commit four more murders that were proven. His right-hand man, Patezel, in an insurance fraud, and Patezel's three children. So, how did Holmes lure people to his hotel? A lot of it had to do simply with its convenience. He was relatively close to the World's Fair, and people needed places to stay. Having a drugstore housed there was also a possible attraction, helping foster a feeling of safety that contrasted with the haphazardly built hotel. We are not sure how many strangers he killed during the World's Fair, but we know what he did to the victims he knew. Holmes was a master manipulator, an educated man with a cunning eye for insurance fraud. He would usually target young women, seduce them, take all the money and properties he could from them and their relatives, and eventually he would make them disappear. In the end, police could only charge Holmes with one murder, Patezel's, but that was enough for the death sentence. Before his execution, Holmes helped build the myths around him with wild claims and changing stories. His famous utterance, which might also be apocrypha, claimed, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me since. Some papers claimed he also said, I will not die by the hand of man, when he was interrogated. When they hanged him, his neck did not break, so he slowly asphyxiated to death for 15 minutes. In spite of the conflicting legends and myths surrounding Holmes, it is quite clear that he did several really bad things. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this story, be sure to like and subscribe, and check the notification bell for our future videos. See you next time.